Welcome. Thank you for choosing to listen to another faith-building message by Pastor David Entry. Faith comes by hearing and by hearing the Word of God. May your knowledge of Jesus Christ increase as you listen. Be blessed. First Peter chapter 3. Last Sunday I ended on the verse 7 and I want to pick it from verse 8. Finally, finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise, blessing. Knowing that ye are there, there unto called that ye should inherit a blessing. For he that will will love life, will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open unto their prayers but the face of the lord is against them that do evil and who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good but and if ye suffer for righteousness sake happy are ye and be not afraid of their terror neither be trouble in jesus name amen here ends the reading of god's word well going straight into the text he said finally it's interesting how it starts by finally that means that there is a there, there has been some um com- a conversation that has been going on already so we have been having some interactions and he says that finally my brethren so it goes on to say um verse eight finally be ye all of one mind finally so he started by in chapter two how we should be living our social lives by telling us this is grace this is charis right that as they speak evil from verse 12 as they speak evil of us the kind of lifestyle we live will command will bring to bear the glory of god in our lives and they'll be forced to admit that there is something unusual in our life so a social life so he goes into social life and he starts by there must be some a harmony in the world in other words our lifestyle we must be in subjection to authority harmony in the world and then it brings it to masters and servants and he said that's workplace harmony so those we are supposed to submit to where we work he said let there be harmony so harmony in the world harmony at work then in chapter three he brings it to harmony at home he says so then it starts likewise ye wives then he comes to verse seven and he says likewise ye have husbands all right so ye wives and ye husband so it brings it to the family setting so in the world generally the workplace then family there must be harmony as a believer or as believers in spite of the fact that we go through suffering and we go through marginalization there must be a certain type of life we live that brings harmony in the world harmony uh, uh, at work and harmony at home and then he said, finally, after all that, this is how you should also conduct yourself. And it's just generally speaking, this is how it should be with you. Finally, be ye all, all of you. Can you imagine one mind? What does that mean? By we should have, we should be we should all be of one mind. What does that mean? All of you be of one mind? How? How are we going to be of one mind? Is, are, you, are, are you talking about, about unity or uniformity? There's a difference between uniformity and unity. See, in Christianity, we have unity. Unity means that it's, we are all moving in one direction. When I say in Christian, in the church, we are meant to have unity. And so there are quite a few places where scriptures clearly tell us that we should have one mind. There are quite a few places. It tells us have one mind, be of one mind, be of. This is one of the places where scriptures tell the believers to be of one mind. We should have the same mind. In uh, in in Romans chapter twelve verse sixteen and Romans chapter fifteen verse five. Look at twelve fifteen. 
Romans 12, 16, Romans 12, 16 said, be of the same mind one towards another. Be of the same mind one towards another. Romans chapter 15, verse 5. Romans 15, verse 5. It talks about how now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be to be like-minded one to toward another according to Christ Jesus. See, this is this is the Christian calling that we should be like-minded one towards another like-mindedness what is this like-mindedness in what way are we supposed to be one mind in one in our in our, in our thinking in in first corinthians chapter 1 verse 10 first corinthians chapter 1 verse 10 it says that now i beseech you brethren by the name of our lord jesus christ that ye all speak the, that no, no no not even just one mind you speak the same thing <laughs> and that there be no division amongst you. Talking about the church life, the church life. You see, so those who create confusion, those who bring uh, argue, uh, contentions amongst brethren, that is so unchristian. He says that I beseech you, I beseech a strong term of uh, uh, pleading with us in the strongest term, in, uh, uh, and joining us, admonishing us in the strongest possible term. I beseech you, brethren, be this uh, uh, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing and that there be no division amongst you divisions among you but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment this brother is saying this and this other person is saying that that is what happens when when there is a church life and there are factions when there are factions in church, when there is, there is segregation in church, when there is division in church, when there is racism in church, when there is sexism in church, when there, there, there is class social class class systems in church, when there are, there, there are status systems in church where you don't belong here, you are here, you are here. When that happens in church, it damages the work of God. So every Christian must be, must ensure that we drive out these things from church. However, the thing is that it is natural with human nature. It comes naturally. I don't, I, I, this, this is I'm not my type. These people, this one I'm not. See, it is only in the church where you, you get the privilege to have a smooth relationship, a brotherly relationship with someone who under normal circumstance, your path will not cross. You, because you are in different social classes, different spheres of operation, different, different, different spheres of operation. And so when you come to church, as I said the other time, we are gloriously heterogeneous, different, different backgrounds, but we are one. We, we are so one that we, we can't discriminate against uh, uh, anyone in the church. Now, does that mean it doesn't happen? It does, because flesh, when flesh gets away. When, does that mean someone who discriminates another, against another person is not a Christian? No, 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 no. The person is still a Christian, but is be, <laughs> hitting below the belt. It's operating below standard. When it comes to Christian demands or Christian dictates, it's operating below standard. Below standard. And so he says, can, this, this is a very strong scripture, very, very strong scripture. Let's look at it again. First Corinthians chapter 1. He says, it, it says that we now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing. Ye all speak. Brothers and sisters, that is why we have to guard against those who create divisions amongst us as a church. Now, okay, pastor, is this just talking about local church or the general church both local church first the local church now how can there be unity in the general church when there is no unity in the local church the local church is the the immediate family unit of the church in any locality local church bodies and then there must be so it's the job of the pastor to make sure that there is oneness in the local church and then there is oneness as we as a body of christ and then but how about denominations because pastor i know some denominations have different differences they don't speak one no listen the fact that we have unity doesn't mean we there's a difference between oneness and unity of faith okay we may have oneness, the fact that you are born again, the fact that you are born again, the fact that um, Ephesians chapter 
4, verse 3, says, endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit. That Greek word translated unity means oneness. Keep the unity, not uniformity, the unity. Okay, so we keep the oneness. He said that be eager and strive earnestly to guard and keep the harmony and oneness of and produce by this. So it is not us who produce it. Human beings can generate that oneness. It comes naturally, automatically, by virtue of the fact that we are born again. We we share something in common. We share oneness of the spirit. So endeavor to keep the oneness of the spirit in the bond of peace. And then he goes on to enlist or mention what keeps us one. The seven things that keep us one. In the verse four, he says that there's one body, number one. There's one spirit. So it's not like you are a different body and I'm a different body. Once we are Christian, we are all part of the same body, one body. First Corinthians 12, 12, one body. If there's only one body. So as the body one has many man members and all the members of that one body being many are one body. All, uh, so also is Christ. So Christ is also one body, no different, different body. When we talk about body, we are not talking about a body of electricians, a body of surgeons, a body of taxi drivers, a bo- uh, body of nurses. No, no, that, not in that sense. But we are talking about uh, an organic union, an organic, there's a difference between, oh, come on, there's a difference between, there's a difference between an organism and an organization. Okay, we the church, we are, even though we are an organization, because it, 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 once it's a, 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 commun- a group of people, things must be organized and run in a certain way. So that makes us an organization. But we are something stronger than just being an organization. The church is not just an organization. It's stronger than organization. It's an organism. An organ- the difference between an organization and an organism is an organization is the assembling, amalgamation of several, several parts bringing different different parts together to form one unit okay so assembling plant so you have car the the engine is manufactured somewhere and then the the the, the body is manufactured the, the tires are manufactured here the the steering wheels are manufactured here the seats are manufactured here. and so you bring them from different different parts and assemble them to have one body which is that uh, Peugeot which is driving or the 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 the, the BMW which is going so by it's come from different parts and the assembling of the parts. Now that is an organization, but the church is not just an organization, it's an organism. What's the what's an organism? An organism is something that has the same shared life. So an organism, you are talking about life. They are talking about organic life, an organic life. What is the organic life? The life of Christ that flows through me is the same life that is flowing through you if you are a Christian. And so I by, for instance, the blood that flows through my finger is the same blood that is flowing in my shoulder. It's the same blood that is flowing in my ear. It's the same blood that is flowing in my ankle. And so it's the same blood that because why well, I'm one life. It's a one organic entity. I'm one organic entity. So when I am, when I was, I was, let's say I was, um, seven years old, I was, I looked seven years old. I wasn't as big as this, but now that I'm at this age and I'm bigger, it's the same life. DNA, the same. Everything is the same David entry. The same David entry. I might look different. There was a time ago I had, I have, I had a lot of hair, but now, but now by nature, see what has happened to me by, <laughs> by nature. There was a time, some time ago, I didn't have any sign of gray in my beard, but see, and so you may see somebody, I'm, I'm I might look different, but it's the same person. It's the same person because why? I am an organism. In the same way, the church is an organism. So the fact that naturally or physically we don't share the same DNA, or spiritually we share the same DNA. And so that Christian in Carriage Church shares the same spiritual DNA with that Christian in Winners Chapel, with that Christian in Church of England, with that Christian in, in Redeemed Christian Church of God, with that Christian in First Love Church, with that Christian with with that Christian in the Methodist Church, with that Christian with the, in the Presbyterian Church, with that Christian in the Baptist Church, with that Christian in, 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 in that other church, in the Action Church. Now, come on, what I'm trying to say is that we may we may not even have the chance to meet, but we are one. We are an organism. We are one organism. We share, so it says that there is we share the same life. So there is one body. 
One body, back to the text, please. There is one body, that's what makes us one. One body, one spirit, even as you are called into one hope, number three, one hope of your current calling. So body, spirit, and hope. Three, oneness. Number five, look at this. One Lord, hallelujah. There's not a di different Jesus in the church of England from a, the Jesus in the current church. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's not a different Jesus in that good church, that Christian church down the road from the church. Yes, there might be slight differences in our doctrinal approaches, but if you are Christian, then we are one. If you are Christian, we are one. If you are Christian and we are one and we have to speak with the same we have to speak the same language one-minded <laughs> hallelujah so one lord one baptism but one faith one baptism and then the seventh one is one god and father of all so the fact that we have oneness does not mean we have uniformity but watch this verse verse 13 talks about so we all come to the unity of faith. Do you see that? So that means that we haven't arrived the unity of belief yet. We are growing. The church is growing to get there. The unity of faith where everything we believe generally is the same. But it takes time and growth. However, there will also be fake, fake ones amongst us whose doctrine will show that they are fake. All right. So now back to the point I am making. It says that we should be of the same mind. First Corinthians chapter one, verse 10. We should be of the same mind. We should speak the same thing. We should be of the same mind. He's beseeching us. Be of the same mind that there be no divisions amongst you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind. Second Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. Second Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. It says that finally, brethren farewell be perfect be of good comfort be of one mind live in peace and the god of love and peace shall be with you you know it's very easy to think christianity is i'm just doing my own thing i'm just believing god for a blessing hmm? no it's christianity is a corporate life he said, so you have to be very concerned when you are not connected to other believers in these kinds of descriptions. You must be very concerned. You are, you are hitting below the belt. You are living below standard if you're a believer and there is no koinonia, there is no fellowship, there is no interaction with other, other believers. It's a problem. It's a problem. It's a problem. A Christian who is not part of a church, what, what, what is that? What is that? It's like a baba who doesn't cut hair. <laughs> a Christian, how? It's unheard of. You are a student, we need to know which school. You are a student, as long as you are a student, you must have a school. If you are a footballer, you must be part of a team. We, you, we must know your team. If you say, I'm a footballer, you know, I play well. Please, well, that's not the problem. Your playing well doesn't matter. You, there is no, no lone ranger footballer, no. There's no, there cannot be, it doesn't happen. It, it, football, football is a teamwork. Christianity is a corporate life. Come on, come on. So you see, for, that's why Satan will do anything to get you hurt, will get you offended in the company. In the company of believers, Satan will do anything to get you hurt or get you offended. So you say, I, I, I don't even want to relate with anybody again. People don't like me. And that's, that's the language of the devil passing through. Satan is deceiving you. Satan is deceiving you that people don't like you. Because when you are a Christian, you put away some things. You put away some things and we, we, so we can be one in our, our thinking. Oneness of mind. Oneness of mind. In First Peter chapter 3, he said, finally... Be of one mind. Philippians 2 2. He said, Philippians 2 2. He said, that, Fill ye, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like minded. Like minded. Now, what does it mean for a believer to be like minded? In other words, we all speak the same language, or we all think alike. There are some things when you ask me, and in the absence of my wife, when I tell you, you go and ask my wife in, the, in my absence, it will be the same thing. It will be the same thing. 
Because we are one in mind. And that's where spiritual maturity comes in. As you are, we are maturing as a church. When the church is growing, it's not just the numbers, but a, a growing church begins to see these signs. Oneness. Oneness of mind among the people. We speak the same doctrine. You won't come to any Karish church and you see somebody is saying that um, one person is saying cohabitation is okay, another person is saying no, no. We, when you hear, we, you can tell we all have uni, uh, uh, unity. We all have unity in our thinking, our doctrinal position, our uh, what we believe is. It's, or let me put it this way: our worldview, our worldview, oneness, believers. It's interesting that when sometimes in, in the secular world, when something happens, maybe in a company or in an organization, and a Christian does something and people are rising against them, sometimes you realize it's even other Christians who are leading it. Other Christians are leading the campaign against Christians. That is why I don't understand those who go and sit on social media and spearhead or, or lead a campaign against some other Christians. If you want to do it, let's do it behind closed doors. Let's sort out our own issues internally. So then, now, what is going on there? Somebody must speak. Who is that somebody? Do you expect people to also to speak about what's going on in your life outside? There? But I need to protect. You have the responsibility of protecting people. So I, I think it's very important. I'm not saying that when people misbehave and do things, we should keep, keep quiet. I'm saying that we have to be careful how we, we, we lead. We lead in condemning other believers publicly. In condemning, that's the same thing they did to Jesus. They condemned him and they said that, bring us Bar Barabbas. There are times where you will see, because the unbelievers, is, it's hot spot for them. It's hot, it's good, it's hot cake. The unbelievers are looking for a reason why you claim you're a Christian, you claim you are good, but you are useless, you are nothing. Unbelievers love it. But they are, unfortunately, there are believers who are like Judas. They will lead the unbelievers and they will take a believer and hand him over to unbelievers to, to butcher him. It is, it's below Christian, Christian uh, decent, um, biblical Christian behavior. Below. There are some things because of your persuasion to in God. There are things that you won't do because it will not help the church. There are things that you, sometimes you just leave it. It's okay. I'll just leave it because it will help the church. It will help the church. It will help the church. There is a proverb, an African proverb, which says that the truth that destroys a nation is not necessarily speaking about it. It's not necessarily speaking and displaying the truth that destroys a nation. The truth that destroys the nation, let's say the nation is built around the king or the leader, and the leader has been the unifying factor of the nation around other nations. Everybody looks at that nation because this is the whatever. And then suddenly you find out that the leader is, um, is being controlled by a body of people behind. So whatever he says is not true. Why are you going to say that to destroy the nation we are all part of? We found out, oh, that's a very disappointing discovery. But what, you know what, we, we can't talk about. If you find out, if you find out some deep secrets about your family and your dad, seriously, maybe your dad is, has a lot of money, but later you find out that he's big fraud. He has done a lot of fraud and stuff like that. People respect him and he's done so much. It's, you know, because of your own, you are part of the company. You are part of every, your life is, you don't have to, you have to stop it. See how you can stop it, how you can support it. But you, some, some things is not worth talking about it because it's going to destroy more. So there are things that, it's, uh, that are necessary to keep going in the interest of the organization. In the, some things are not worth saying. We have to sort it out internally, but it's not worth saying. That's what I'm saying. That you, How come we, we go out and, and lead the campaign against Christians? How can you be a Christian and lead a campaign when the Christian that did something that is not, maybe, it's not even verified. How come another Christian in the same organization, in the same company, at the workplace, be the one who picks up on other Christians and then gathers with unbelievers and planning to destroy the person? And, and they do that and feel free. Yeah, yeah, me, me, I know. <laughs> 
Hallelujah. I'm not supposing that things should be covered when evil, world, when crime is going on, something wrong is going on, should be covered. That's not what I'm supposing. What I'm saying is that as Christians, we owe one, an, one another the love to, to cover one another or to love one another, to protect one another, to help one another, not necessarily to ex expose as expose one another but to help one another be in the right hallelujah so he said be of the same mind first Peter chapter 8 finally my brethren be of this be of, be of one mind having compassion one of another oh wow compassion has come in compassion compassion having compassion one uh, one of another love as brethren be pitiful be courteous, have compassion. When you are dealing with people, put yourself in their shoes. The, the one another talks about amongst the Christians. Put yourself in their shoes. Yes, I know. I know that they, what they said, they shouldn't have said that it hurts you. But you know what? You might have also, or you could have also said something to offend them. Oh, I didn't like what they were saying about me. You know what? Oh, so he's, he's, he, he, he was, is that what he said about me? Unfortunately, someone came and told you what the other brother or the other sister said about you, which was not so nice, but they have been having chat with you and they never said, it. and behind your back, is that what they are saying? All of us sometimes, you know, we think differently about people. And so what I'm saying is that we have to be sympathetic, uh, co compassion with Shinet towards one another. In what sense? I know the brother offended you, but you could have also offended somebody. So just, 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 just let him go. Let her off the hook. Let her off the hook. Let's learn to forgive one another. <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God, praise God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. So be tender, tender hearted. Or not have compassion towards one another. Finally, be ye of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren. If you remember in First Peter chapter 1, verse 22, we spoke about a mask love. Remove the mask. Let love be without dissimulation. Let love be the real thing. Let, let our love be real. He says that love one another. The Bible keeps telling us how we should love. We should love. We should love. Love as brethren. That's that love there is Philadelphia, love as, uh, love as brethren, brotherly love, Philadelphia or Philadelphos, fellow, fellow love, brotherly love, Adelphos, brothers. So phila, fellow love of brethren, love of brethren, Philadelphia or fellow Adelphos. So love as brethren, we should, we should have love. So, you know, there are Sometimes there, there, there may be times my sister or my brother might say something I might not like, but you know what? I just have to get over it. It's my brother now. That's what he said. Love as brethren. Love as brethren because what, in other words, if my brother is in trouble, I'm in trouble. If my sister is in trouble, I'm in trouble. So let's love as brethren and be compassionate one to another. Hallelujah. Uh, I empathize and sympathize with one another. I said, be, pity, be pitiful and, and, and in the New King James. In the, new, uh, in the New King James, it said, be tender hearted, that pitifulness, have compassion. And then sometimes your heart is very soft. When you have a tender heart, you are very, you become very vulnerable and susceptible to things. And it says, let's allow ourselves to have tender heart towards one another as believers. Tender heart tender heartedness towards one another and he used the word courteous. Some other translations use the word um, humble humble courteous passionate and humble humility is a virtue when it comes to christianity humility is a virtue is so important in first peter chapter 5 verse 5 in ephesians chapter 4 verse 2 first peter chapter 5 verse 5 it said likewise ye younger submit yourselves unto the elder ye all uh, ye all uh, yeah sorry yeah all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility in church bro let's clothe ourselves with humility and when i say in church not only during church service but once you're a believer and dealing with other believers some you call somebody you say the way you spoke to me i'm going to prove to you well, come on let's clothe ourselves with some humility and sometimes let some things go let sleeping dogs lie Ephesians chapter 4 
verse 2. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2 says that with, uh, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, bearing one another in love, forbearing one another in love. Sometimes you have to bear with people. Yeah, he says, well, I don't like the way this guy behaves. But you know what? Bear one another in love with lowliness and meekness. The same thing. It's, a, it's translated meekness here by lowliness and meekness, humility and being courteous. You can't speak to people anyhow. As a believer, it's very important. And then it goes on to speak. Wow. It goes on to say that uh, <laughs> then it says, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing and other translations use reviling for reviling all right not rendering a lot rendering evil for what you've done to me i'll do back me watch this it doesn't matter how long it is i'll do back i'll do it i will do it no the bible says don't don't render evil for evil don't render evil for evil don't render don't render evil for evil romans chapter 12 verse 17 first thessalonians 5, 5 romans 12 17 says that recompense to no man evil for evil did you see that first thessalonians chapter 5 verse 15 first thessalonians chapter 5 see that no none renders evil for evil unto any man even not just christians any man but ever follow that which is good, both amongst yourself and to all men. This is this is this is Christianity 101. See that you render, you don't render it. someone has done this, you also do you do you some people don't know how to forgive or how to let go. They did this to you, you said, I will do it. Even if it takes 10 years, if it takes 10 years, I will do it. Watch it, I'll do it. I will do it. I will do it. I will do it said don't render evil for evil two wrongs don't make a right don't render evil for evil don't render i think on this at this note i would like to actually go to romans chapter um 12 from verse 9 because the same thing is treated in romans chapter 12 from verse 9 virtually romans chapter 12 verse 9 it says that let love be without dissimulation without hypocrisy okay let love be without dissimulation abhor that which is evil Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. Did you see that? It's almost the same thing we have been reading here. But it's interesting that modern day Christians don't say don't see these things. You see, pastor to pastor, pastor against pastor, a church leader against another church leader, and a pastor that has left one church against the other one who has been left. Over. It's we fight amongst them. It's like it's like look, watch this, watch this. It says that. Um, let, let love be without dissimulation. Above that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulations. What are you going to be patient in these troubling times? Continuing uh, instant in prayer. Continuing instant in, in 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 prayer distributing to the necessity of saints give giving to hospitality learn how to receive people give to the need of others give to the need of others when you see someone is in need he said distributing to the necessity of the saints this brother is in need of something this sister is in need of distribute to their necessity it is christianity 101 in romans romans chapter 12 I call, we, we encourage, we call it the R129 principle of fellowship, of philosophy of fellowship, the R129 philosophy of fellowship. We cannot have effective Christian fellowship in the absence of this. We have to, this is part of our, our, if you're a Christian, this is what you have been called into, excuse me. This is what you have been called into. It's not as for me, I, I, I'm just, it's Christ. It's, please, 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 please. The Christ in you must find an expression like this this can so if christ is really in you this is what invariably as you grow in christ is beginning to show other than that you are in the flesh you are in the flesh anytime there's pro there are problems in church and confusions in church the bottom line is this this the absence of some of these things most problem causes in church are not maturing you, you, you 
it, it is not your quotation, the number of quotations you understand or you are quoting that shows that you are matured. It is the manifestation of these things in your living, your life, the manifestation of biblical patterns in your life. That is the reflection of true spiritual maturity. True spiritual maturity has everything to do with the manifestation of the biblical pattern in a person's life. The manifestation of the biblical patterns, the biblical dictates, the biblical in, uh, injunctions, the biblical the biblical directions. When they manifest in a person's life, that is what shows that a person is a true Christian. Or, uh, sorry, not true. That person is a, a spiritually maturing. A, a spiritually, ma it's not how how many tongues you speak per second. <laughs> Please, it's not a sign that you are mature. It's not the gift, the spiritual. I, I can have visions. I can have dreams. I have word of knowledge, word of wisdom. I have discernment of spirit, interpretation of tongues, diverse kind of tongues, gift of healing. I have the working of miracles. I have the gift of faith. Please, it is not a sign of maturity. It is not a sign of maturity. There are a lot of people who are putting in gifts and because of the gift, they think they are spiritually matured. Spiritual maturity is not based on gift. Spiritual maturity is based on the expression of biblical dictates in your life. It must be seen. It must be seen and noticed. And it starts not best by action. It starts in the heart. So that even when you are caught unawares, it is actually a, a natural flow from what is in your heart, not a pose. Some of us have the pose. So in church, you look so decent. You look so good. But listen, it's a facade. It's a facade. When you are the, with the believers, you look so cool externally. Uh, re your reputation is so impeccable. But guess what? Deep in your heart, you are like a whitewashed tomb in Jesus' own very words. In Jesus' very, <laughs> very, very words. Whitewashed tombs. You are white. You look white on the outside, but full of dead men's bones. <laughs> That's what Jesus said to the Pharisees. <laughs> Hallelujah. And, and so, <laughs> Matthew chapter 23, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. <laughs> That's a serious one. What? But that's not your story. You are a different person. You are not a Pharisee. You are not a hypocrite. You are not a hypocrite. But what I'm saying is that um, when I talk about spiritual maturity, the, I'm not talking about personal bent. Some people are personally, by nature, temperament, by their temperament, they are very calm people. But don't mistake that to mean that it's a mature Christian. <laughs> Some people are very forgiving by nature. Even before they became born again, they are forgiving by nature. All right, they will forgive you. It doesn't mean you are a maturing believer. Some people are forgiving by nature, but can't have one mind. Some people are, uh, uh, um, they have one mind, but they can't love without, without phoniness. You know, so these things are what all of us pastors included the fact that i'm preaching doesn't mean i'm so matured okay you can preach you can you can explain it you can be theologically deep it doesn't mean you are biblically sound or you are biblically weighty the word of god dwells in you richly the, that is where spiritual maturity comes from spiritual maturity is not necessarily hinged watch this spiritual maturity is not hinged on rectification of your behavior so your behavior is changing no even though it will affect your behavior spiritual maturity is first hinged on your identity in christ discovery of your identity when you know who you are in christ you and you understand from scriptures and you begin to let that become your expression work out your salvation with fear and trembling then you are you are talking about someone is maturing and i'm saying that these are some of the signs of genuine maturity don't be using it to look in others for your own self okay i have to use this to judge my own self and to assess my life whether i'm maturing spiritually because of the way i i these things play out in my life let me go back to it he says that 
um, distributing to the necessity of sins, giving to hospitality. Bless them that persecute you. Bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice. Weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind. Did you see that? Be of the same mind, one towards another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of lowliness. It's like for me, I don't, this, are not, this, this type of people are not my class. You have, you, when you join a church, you only befriend people of a certain status. These are the, your, your cronies in the church. If they are not of a certain color or a certain status, you, don't, you are not interested. When you hear that this one, oh, he owns the company here, he lives here, suddenly they become your friend. It's not, you are not growing. <laughs> you, you are not growing spiritually. No, 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 no. You are not growing. <laughs> he says, um, be of the same mind, verse, verse, verse 16 again, be of the same mind one towards another, mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate, be, uh, be not wise in your own conceits. Um, verse 17, recompense to no man evil for evil, provide things honest in the sight of all men. You cannot be lying and not know. <laughs> you cannot be lying and not, and not know please <laughs> and you cannot be speaking the truth and not know it <laughs> and not know that i'm speaking the truth oh i was i didn't know i was speaking the truth I, I, I didn't know i was lying no you cannot be lying and not know and you cannot be speaking the truth and not know may god help us all and then it's and it says that recompense to no man evil for evil provide things honest in the sight of all men if it's possible as much as lies in your in you do you see that as much as lies in you live peaceably with all men including your wife your husband your your cousin your neighbors live peaceably to with all men your mom with your dad live peaceably with all men live peaceably with all men <laughs> Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, that's God saying. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink, for in so doing thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome, uh, overcome evil with good. How do you overcome evil with good? How do we overcome evil with good? There's an African adage which says that if good doesn't matter, then evil doesn't matter. Please, it's not the Bible. <laughs> if doing good doesn't matter, then doing evil should be also matter. Please, it's not the Bible. It says, overcome evil with good. Overcome evil with good. Wow. The Bible is sweet, you know. It's sweet to the taste of the believer, of the regenerated. Hallelujah. All right, let me just add. Oh, one more, and then we can draw the curtain on it. Um, verse, so verse, uh, verse nine, going back to First Peter chapter three, verse eight. So finally, brethren, uh, finally, be be ye all of one mind, having compassion one one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing. All right, railing there, as I said in some translation, is uh, reviling was reviling to be angrily accused vow, violently or in a very rude way they accuse you you sometimes you're not even you, 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 you even know what they're talking about it's like you you, you you're full of that oh and it's being violently accused be violently insulted and in an unjustifiable way, he says that don't return it. Don't return it, bro, 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 no. Don't do it back. Don't do it back to her. Don't do it back to him. Don't return it. Not returning evil for evil or uh, uh, reviling for reviling. Don't do that. But on the contrary, blessing. What? Blessing? Yes. On the contrary, blessing. Knowing that you were called to this. To what? that you also inherit a blessing. So as you bless, you are also stepping in blessing. Wow. They are doing things, but blessing. Bless you, bless you. It's okay, just walk away, bless you. <laughs> Christian maturity. 
Luke chapter 6, verse 28, it, it, it addresses the issue of the blessing there. Bless them that curse you and pray for them which despisefully use you. Romans chapter 12, verse 14. We've read it already, but let's look at it again. Romans chapter 12, verse 14. It says that bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Wow. This is this is this is raising a kind of an interesting issues here <laughs> for the charismatics and then uh, <laughs> in first corinthians chapter 4 verse 12 look at first corinthians chapter 4 verse 12 it says that and labor working with your own hands being reviled we bless working with our own hands being reviled we bless being persecuted we suffering when they revile us we bless them so he says that don't render evil for evil reviling for reviling but contrary blessing, knowing that as you are blessed, knowing that this is what you have been called for. You've been called, we are called. In First Peter chapter 1, verse 15, talks about how we have been called, all right? It talks about how we have been, he has called us his holy. So we have to live, be holy in all manner of your conversation. So he has called us to be holy. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14. So called to be holy. Second Thessalonians 2, 14. Whereunto he, uh, uh, whereunto he called you by our gospel to obtain, to, uh, to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord. So you have been called to be holy. You have been called to obtain glory. Glory, glory, I see it coming for you in the mighty name of Jesus. We have been called to obtain glory. Someone shall glory. And not only that, we have also been called into fellowship. So we've been called to, to live holy. We have been called to obtain glory. And 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9, he said, God, who has called us into fellowship of his dear son, Hallelujah. He has called us. So God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of this, his son, Jesus Christ. So we have been called to bless so as to inherit blessings. We have been called to be holy. We have been called to, uh, to partake or obtain the glory of God. And we have been called into fellowship. Hallelujah. 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 We are the called one. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. Call forth to show, call to show forth the praise of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We have been called. We have been called to obtain blessing. Amen. Hallelujah. I pray you have received something and your eyes have been enlightened by the power of God. Thank you for listening. To hear more from David Entry, follow him on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Why don't you subscribe to our YouTube channel at Caris Church and subscribe to our podcast so you are always up to date. Be blessed.